Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third scholarship hour uh, of Vital Week. As you can see today, we're, we're in a, a different place. We've just finished the launch of the National Sectoral Project, Next Steps for Teaching and Learning, Moving Forward Together. I hope, you're able to, I hope you join us at the launch. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, the session is going to be recorded as the other sessions have been and it'll be released this afternoon, later this afternoon onto the National Forum website. Um, if you would like to view subtitles, you're able to turn on your subtitles by, by pressing the, the, the subtitles button at the end of the Zoom screen. Um, I'm delighted to say that our graphic illustrator, um, Esther, is also with us today and you can keep an eye on Twitter uh, for some of her images later on this afternoon and uh, we'll be looking at them in detail at the closing event on Friday. Today's chair is uh, Karina Maguire, a National Forum Board Member, so I'm delighted now to hand over to Karina. Welcome everybody and thanks for tuning in. Um, this is a very exciting follow-on from the launch earlier of the Next Steps project and I suppose it's, it's fantastic to have another hour and we're hopefully you'll stick with us for the hour. We have some really, really interesting GASTA talks um, and also we have our first poster showcase today and later on we will be uh, showcasing our podcast for our fellow who unfortunately can't be with us today and that's uh, Dr Barry Ryan. But now let me hand you over to our uh, GASTA master because I know most of you are just here to uh, listen to Dr. Tom Farley and his, his GASTA approach. So over to you, Tom. So uh, we have Derby Cullinan from Trinity College up in Dublin. Uh, so we're starting off today up in Dublin there. And our, our, the title is Reviving the Anatomic Past, Breathing New Life into Historic animatronical teaching tools. So, I mean, oh my God, that in itself, uh, you've taken up about 90 seconds of your five minutes already. Okay, are we all ready to start and get ready for, for the gossip well. there? Like, so we just start off nice and handy. We get the hands up here now. We're going to start off here. I, I, I can see people on the screen. Colin, come on, get the hands up here. I know you're helping out here at the back, but I want to see hands up. Hands up, everybody. Are we ready to, to start off? Okay. We'll just get, oh, I need to get my, my timer ready to go. And then we're, then we're ready to go. Okay. Uh, Hain. Oh, that's pathetic. Pathetic. Put the mics on. Put the mics on. Uh, Hain. A two. A three. A car. A Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Dervila Kulnan and I am a research assistant here in the Department of Anatomy at Trinity College Dublin, working under the guidance of project lead Dr. Dennis Barry. So I invite you to take uh, five minutes to sit back and take a journey with me into the past as we examine anatomy through the eyes of our yesteryear educators. So the Anatomy Museum at Trinity College Dublin houses an extensive collection of historic specimen illustrations and models that retain significant pedagogical value. However, due to their delicate nature and rarity, these tools are not currently used for anatomy um, teaching and student learning. So this project therefore aims to rejuvenate these teaching tools by um, incorporating them into an online platform which showcases their typical and normal perspectives of the human body. And through the inclusion of case histories and information about the anatomists of the time, we take students on a journey into the past uh, to learn from this exceptional value, um, or content rather. So um, why? Well, in the words of uh, Scottish anatomist Frederick Knox, he who attempts to teach anatomy without a museum strictly deserves the name of imposter. So in 2010, a call was made to anatomists to develop strategies to rejuvenate these um, tools and basically prevent them from disappearing altogether. So other than funding that enabled museum upkeep, there has been a lack of innovation in terms of utilising these specimens for modern teaching. So by digitising them, we are incorporating them into an online platform and the contemporary student can then learn from the uh, students of, of the past. So this short snippet here is an excerpt from our tool and it showcases how students can hover their mouse over anatomical structures um, to identify them. And then on the right hand side, there is also some supporting information for students. 
And these illustrations here that I've just taken as an example, they are from Joseph MacLeese's Atlas of Surgical Anatomy, um, and that dates back to 1856. And MacLeese was Irish. Uh, he was a surgeon, anatomist, and evidently a very gifted medical illustrator. Um, and then this section here is just a who, what, when, where, why section, which gives the, um, the specimen or the tools um, a bit of provenance and place. So to exhibit another example, here is a specimen which is accompanied by an exceptional um, case report dating back to 1896. And this specimen is that of a female infant who was born with a congenital malformation. And in the report, we learn that Dr. Kidd um, performed a treatment um, in an attempt to save the child's life. And while unfortunately it was unsuccessful, we learn on post-mortem examination that he was only a mere one sixteenth of an inch away from successfully performing surgery. So what do the students learn here? Well, a few things. Firstly, the existence of congenital malformations. Uh, secondly, information about historical treatment approaches and modern treatment approaches. And most importantly, the importance of radiological guides, which now make a very simple procedure like this successful in up to 100% of cases. So we argue that specimens like this with an accompanied case report are completely unparalleled by modern teaching tools. So how does this enhance uh, scholarship amongst students and teachers of anatomy? Well, firstly, the online platform aligns with existing curricular elements at Trinity College Dublin and therefore consolidates learning and enhances the student experience. Secondly, by developing um, faculty approved information, the transactional distance between faculty and students is reduced. And then the third thing is that it immediates the over-reliance of students on online platforms to uh, source on anatomical information. And lastly, because it's online, it increases the capacity for self-directed learning. So our tool invites students to experience the anatomy of the past, and by breathing new life into this historic teaching tools, the educational merit proposed by the past anatomists is revived. To once again quote anatomist Frederick Knox, without museums, the profession of anatomy would be in the state of a man without a language. And with that, Gasta. Well done, Dervla. Another person who's going to break my heart today and, and finish bang on time. You're all doing superbly good job. I do actually love the quote from Knox. I think that's really, really good. So well done. And just a, a, a virtual round of applause for everybody there for Dervla. So very well done. Um, as I said, we have a lot to be to, to, to get through today because we're doing four and then a, a video break and then four afterwards. So I won't hang about. We're going to stay in, in the capital, although I'm sure Cork people might disagree where the, the actual capital is. But there we have it. We're going over to University College Dublin to Sandra Nicholson. And once again, keeping the whole uh, anthropomorphic uh, thing going on, um, Sandra's... Sandra's presentation is Authentic Teaching on Interpreting Animal Emotions. So I, once again, I say, I mean, the, the titles themselves are certainly uh, interesting. OK, so as I said, um, one thing I just I just want to remind people again, don't forget, as I said, these are a very useful shout out and, and showcase for people. So please get in touch with people if they've done something which is exciting or stimulating and that you want to get in touch with them please do okay so we will just get back again to a little bit of counting here because as i said i know we could be sitting here and say i want people to feel part of a community and if i'm going to be up counting i want to see everybody else counting there katrina i, I see a lovely there vision of the campanile in the background there so get the hands up here excellent okay get the hands up excellent are we ready alice Childs, come on that's it good girl uh hein a doe, no. a tree, tree. a car, a, a cooey, a a Hi everybody, um, I'm Sandra Nicholson, I'm lecturer in veterinary nursing at UCD and I'm both delighted and somewhat nervous to be here today as a first time guest to hear. But I'd like to tell you about how I designed and delivered some authentic teaching for veterinary nursing students on interpreting animal emotions and how studying the teaching and learning enabled me to gain new insights into the student learning process. Veterinary nursing students need to be able to interpret animal emotional state to stay safe in their interactions with them, but also to better cater to their patients' needs. 
Obviously, the most authentic way to teach this would be by using real animals, live animals in real time. However, apart from logistical and ethical barriers to this, there's a couple of other big problems. The first is the dog in school effect. I don't know if any of you remember when we were younger in primary or secondary school and a dog got loose in the school and how wonderfully distracting that was. Well, it turns out that has an impact on veterinary nurses stu uh, students too, because um, losing live animals in teaching sometimes distracts them from learning the knowledge and skills that they need to learn. The second problem is that emotions can pass quickly and students need time to process the body language signals that have been given off and to make their evaluation. And unlike the images on the screen, animals cannot be paused in real life. Therefore, I decided to use Creative Commons images and YouTube videos in my teaching. I embedded these images and films in a teaching structure that aligned with authentic learning principles as described by Harrington and Oliver in 2000. Firstly, in my lectures on animal behavior, I described the body language and behavior of each emotion in each species. Then I um, talked students through my own process of how I interpret the body language um, and behavioral signals to determine the animal emotional state. I created a series of discussion boards and strongly encouraged students to post images, to analyze and describe the body language and behavioral signals, and to make an interpretation of emotional state. This gave them a chance to reflect and practice the skill, and I could give them feedback on it. I designed an online um, aligned quiz on Brightspace, um, which involved images and multi-select questions and was, was worth 15% of the module grade. I decided to st study the teaching and learning as part of the UCD professional diploma in university teaching and learning. And I particularly focused on student engagement in lectures and in on discussion boards, the contents of discussion board posts and student performance in the online quiz. And I found it some really interesting things. In particular, I learned more about how the process of how students could be learning this, which is really important because there's very little that's, that is known or in the literature about this. So subjectively in lectures, I noticed that students often missed important body language signals and sometimes um, made in, in, incorrect um, interpretations. By the time they were using the discussion boards, however, they could always identify the predominant emotion in an image, but they often missed the second emotion and mixed emotion cases. This was independent of the species involved and of the emotion in question. So this is, gives me a little snapshot into what the student's learning journey could be. I'm not sure what the next step is yet because we haven't got to that yet. Another interesting thing that I found was that anthropomorphic language was used at times by students for dogs and cattle, but not for cats. For example, one student described a dog as having sad, anxious eyes when really their dilated pupils with tension over the brow. However, it didn't seem to in interfere with them being correct in their interpretations. Finally, performance in the online quiz was excellent with grades exceeding 70% which seemed to suggest that my teaching strategy was successful. However, I would need to test the student with live animals to be sure that the learning would transfer. I need to thank a number of people for helping me in my research journey. People involved with the UCD professional diploma in university teaching and learning as listed here, and the student participants of the research project, without whom I wouldn't have gained this information that I'm now able to channel back into my teaching. And thank you to all, all of you for listening. And that's Gasta. Very well done. Um, but uh, once again, Sandra, someone else who was determined to, 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 to upset me today and, and <laughs> get in well on time. Now, it's some really, really good stuff. And I'd, I'd, I'd certainly like to hear um, the next stage of, uh, of that particular research. And I think also it's, it's, it's really nice to see something there from, from your own professional development kicking off and leading them to, uh, to, that, to that project there. So I think that, that's lovely here to, 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 to see. So uh, our next one is a, is a colleague uh, of mine, and, and uh, as I said, in our, in our new university, Tom Broderick, and, and uh, as I said, Eileen O'Leary, Linda O'Sullivan, and, and uh, Jim O'Mahony. So uh, this is uh, the Be Active Framework for Active Learning. So it's a, a lot of activity down, down uh, this part of the world. So uh, as I said, I think that we started off nice and handy. We, we do a bit of left to right there and swaying around there. People looking very, very comfortable. They're looking a little bit staid. And uh, so as I said, uh, we, 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 we get the hands up again there. Kieran O'Leary, I can see you up in Dublin there like that. And uh, 
Uh, we're looking a bit more relaxed than the last time we met online. So, <laughs> but I'll, I'll mention that in the next one. Okay, are we ready, everybody? Here, get the hands up here. All right, you can stamp your feet as well if you want. Are we ready? <laughs> uh, hey, a do, a tree, a car, a cooing, a Okay, hello everyone. My name is Thomas Broderick. I'm representing the Teaching and Learning Unit here in Munster Technological University. I'm really looking forward to today for the next four and a half minutes. So all you need to do is this, guys. You just need to um, be like the nodding dog here and um, say, oh, yes, Tom, that's very interesting for the next few minutes. So thanks. Good to see some of you nodding there. When we talk about the Be Active Framework, we're not talking about this, guys. So you don't need to worry about standing up and um, do any jumping jacks. So just relax and listen, because what I do want to talk about is this Be Active Framework. The Be Active Framework is, a, I suppose, it's an exploratory framework based on the, the acronym Be Active, and it's there to support staff and students to enhance teaching and, and support uh, kind of student engagement and, and deeper learning as a result. So it's important, I suppose, it, it is um, based on research as is active learning strategy. So I think in a talk like this, we won't go into detail, but it's nice to have the big words like retrieval practice and cognitive load theory and short-term to long-term memory. So um, it's nice to have them in the, in the PowerPoint. Um, the Be Active framework, and this is what I want to talk about. Guys, this is available as part of the Vital this week, this poster. So you can access this at your own time and spend a bit more time in it. I do want to kind of highlight some areas, and that is if you look at the right-hand side there, there's an activity section on the poster. So that will allow you to click into the activity and will give you something to work on in that space. And also as part of this, we've developed kind of an animated video that will give you two or three minutes that will help you find out more information about the Be Active framework. What I'd like to do for the next kind of three minutes is outline some of the key points of it to give you an idea to entice you to engage more after this talk. So first of all, when we begin looking at our context, the B of the Be Active is to begin looking at your context and think about what you're currently doing that's working well and maybe look at areas that you could potentially improve on and maybe active learning might be part of that strategy. And also if you're in the, in the, in the space of scholarship of teaching and learning, this might be an opportunity to say, look, I'm trying something new in my teaching. Can this inform my research? It can inform my scholarship. So maybe to talk to someone in your institution about ethical consideration, if that's where you're at. The A for the active framework stands to analyze and assess. And I think looking at what you teach, who you teach and where you teach, is that online? You know, what level the students are at and what do you want the students to be able to do or know? So within this B active framework, the A allows you to analyze your context and see what works or what you might want to address. And then we would recommend that you assess some active learning strategies and maybe engage further. And we recommend the KP Cross Academy there to you to develop further to find out some active learning strategies. The C for the active framework is to choose the active learning strategy that works best for you in your context and that you're comfortable delivering. And you can see a list there on the screen from simple to complex. And then communicate why active learning is important for you and, and sell it to the students. And if anyone wants to see a good video about selling a product, that Dollar Shave Club is excellent. Nothing to do with active learning, but how they sell it is very engaging and worthwhile. The T then, guys, for you, I suppose, with, when you've tried a new active learning strategy and you've decided, I'm going to do this, well, maybe think about how you could build trust around this new way of, of maybe teaching and looking at teaching and learning. So test this new strategy and see does, see how it goes for you and build trust by, by bringing the students on this journey with them, with you and sharing why you're doing this and what they will have to do. And then take this, third, take this step further. The I is to maybe investigate and, and ask questions like, well, were my instructions effective? Was the timing, the sequencing of this active learning strategy, was it inclusive and how I can improve on it? And that takes us to the V, which you might be familiar with, gives reflective cycle. We, we, we ask you to think about how can I validate this active learning strategy with my current groups and how do I add value to it and do it better the next time? And I think that leads on lastly to the last step, which this is looking at your overall practice again, about saying, how can I evaluate, enhance and engage my students further? So you might first of all evaluate, did that work? Is that strategy worthwhile doing again? How could I enhance it and do it better the next time? And look at your overall practice of teaching and learning and maybe engage in further activity and further research around that. So I know what you're thinking, guys, where do I find out more? I've talked about a lot there. So we'd ask you to check it out. The poster is there for Vital as part of this. Toshe on, have a look at it and engage with it. 
And also, as part of the National Seminar Series, the National Forum, on January the 13th, we have an active learning to engage students to enhance learning workshop. So please engage further. I want to finish by thanking the active learning team in MTU, myself, Dr. Eileen Leary, Linda O'Sullivan, and Professor Jim O'Mahony. That's the email address if you want to contact us further. So I'll be finished by saying thanks for listening. Thanks on the National Forum. And thanks, Tom. Let's go, Gasta. Oh, my Lord. Well, I'm not surprised, Thomas. Absolutely wonderful. Round of applause here. You're talking about absolutely four minutes and 58 seconds. He gets in all the contact details, shares them all, gets in the, the, the thing with the seminar. So, you know, look, if you had a mic, Thomas, I'd be expecting you to kind of just go boom and just sort of drop it. That was a, an absolute great one. No pressure on Kieran O'Leary. He's going to be coming up next there, like, you know, but... Um, but there is a lot of pressure here on, sad to say. Thomas has really put down a, an excellent marker. But no, joking, so it, it, it's, it's really good. Um, Thomas, if you want to put up the, the link to the to that seminar uh, in January, it's really useful. So as I said, um, from from MTU, we're going to shoot back up to uh, TU Dublin, to Kieran O'Leary. Um, Shore Bites, introducing research to fourth-year students. Um so uh, up in, in uh, from the, the Sure Network. So Kieran, if you uh, have your presentation ready to come up, and then we'll do our counting then. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Tom. Love it there. Excellent. Right. Okay. So if we're all ready now. As I said, are we just in the count? We're going to go left to right. We we'll start off on the hand to the left, so to the right. Are we all ready? I don't know. I can't see myself. I'm sure somebody can see me. Anyway, here we go. So we're going to go to the left on the hand. Are we ready? Uh, hand. A dome, no. a tree, a, tree. a car, a, car. a cooey, cooey. Gosta. 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 Uh, hello, hello, everyone, and Gormaga uh, Tom uh, for the introduction. It's uh, very nice to see you again. Um, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you all the, this afternoon about the Surebits project, which has been run by the Sure Network. The sure Network is a, it's a national network of higher education institutions that has the objective of enhancing the integration of research into undergraduate science programs. Um, and this is based on the idea that by becoming more actively involved with research, students, undergraduate students, have an opportunity to develop key graduate attributes, including critical thinking, communication, problem solving, uh, and so on. But research can also be a wonderful motivator for students as they develop their understanding and their awareness of how their discipline area connects uh, to the world of discovery. So to build these connections, over the past five years, the Shore Network uh, has run conferences, you know, go, going back to 2018. Um, and uh, we've run an undergraduate journal uh, as well, and, and that's gone through a number of issues. Um, but these are primarily focused on the final year, uh, final year projects and the work that students do towards the end of their undergraduate studies. But we recognise within the network that research is not something that should be restricted to the final year of, um, of undergraduate studies. Because throughout their undergraduate studies, students should be developing their knowledge of, their curiosity towards, and their skills in research. And so with the help of the National Forum, who generously funded our project through the Network and Discipline Fund, the Sure Network has implemented this project called SureBits. And it specifically and, and directly aims to engage students from across all years, but particularly first and second year students, to engage them with research. So a sure bit is a 10 minute video made by a researcher. It's designed to be played in class for undergraduate students, in particular, those first year students who may never have considered that research is an important activity that takes place in higher education and who might not be aware that higher education is not just about the acquisition of knowledge, but it's about the journey of discovery. Uh, so playing a sure bit video in class takes just 10 minutes. And within the video, the students will meet a researcher, so an academic or a postgrad, um, they'll get to consider a problem posed by the researcher. Then during a pause in the video, they'll be asked to consider the solutions to the particular problem. And then they'll listen to the researcher explaining the solution at the end. We've developed a rich suite of Sherbet videos. We have them all here online and we've begun to use them in class this year where they've been very enthusiastically received uh, by first year students all across uh, Ireland. Students have engaged with the problems and they've engaged with each other. And several students have sent emails to the researchers that they watched. And we're delighted to have got the reaction so far uh, that we were looking for. So all of our videos are online uh, here. They're all in uh, different categories. Um, they're all uh, directed towards the sciences, of course. Um, 
So uh, if we take, for example, if we go into biology, just as, as one example, and we see a number of videos in here. So the first one or the second one listed is by uh, my colleague, John Butler, Dr. John Butler. Um, and he asks the question, uh, what is the most important sense for walking? And he gives three solutions to students. So when this video is played for students, John speaks for about five minutes. Then during the two minute pause, the students consider uh, solutions that John has presented. And then John comes back on screen in the last few minutes to explain his solution. If we go to environment and sustainability, obviously extremely topical. Uh, this is one of my favorite videos that we have. It's from Kira Davis uh, down in Limerick. Um, Kira has put together a video that asked the question, how are we going to feed Martian colonies? Which I think is a wonderfully engaging question that is really going to stimulate interest among undergraduate students. It certainly got me thinking about uh, Kira's research. And there are many, many more videos all available up on our website um, at surenetwork.e forward slash surebits. We have a promotional video there as well that explains how surebits can be used in class. So all that remains is for me to issue a call to all of you because we're looking for people to use our videos uh, in class. So if you're a student or a graduate um, considering further research, you can navigate through our videos as well and learn a little bit um, about research in that way. If you're lecturing students, please do consider um, using these videos, just taking 10 minutes from a class to play one of these videos and let us know that you're doing it because we'd love to involve you in our evaluation. And watch as your students do, you know, learn to appreciate the, the work that takes place in universities in research. And to those of you who are researchers, we'd love uh, to hear from you if you were interested in making one of these videos. So all you would need to do is get in touch with us and we'd be able to guide you through that process. But regardless of how you want to get involved or if you want to get involved, um, you can just get in touch with myself or anyone else on the project team and I'll put those links into the chat. So that's it for me. Uh, that's uh, Gosta, I think, Tom. Well so thanks that's very it. much. Perfect timing. Absolutely brilliant, Kieran. And uh, can I just say to congratulate, I mean, as someone who teaches research methods, undergrads, I think sometimes the, the relationship for, for, for undergrads, they, they say there's something, a, a very distinct and remote activity, and that's something that they necessarily aspire to. So I think there, that's actually a, a great, great resource. And I would echo, that I think certainly the, the, all I'm looking for now is maybe some people in, in get involved with social science stuff. But yeah, I think it's absolutely brilliant. And this is the sort of stuff that I suppose this is where I think Gosta really comes into its own, a little bit of crowdsourcing and sharing information. So absolutely uh, well done. Uh, a round of applause for Kieran and the virtual one for, for all our Gosta tours. We're going to take a, a, uh, a pause now in the Gostas and uh, I'm going to hand you over now to to uh, Karina McGuire. Uh, she's going to introduce some um, video scholarship posters at uh, the showcase event. So I'll see you all in a few minutes. I'll hand over to you, Karina. That's great. Thanks a lot, Tom. And thank you so much to the uh, timekeeping of our guest speakers. Uh, I think Tom's reputation precedes him. So what we want to have a look at now is something that's actually quite important in our teaching and learning environment because a picture can tell us an awful lot as well particularly when there's so much data floating around. So as part of the uh, scholarship, the teaching and learning uh, focus on scholarship as part of the Vital Week, we did put out a call for contributions to poster showcases and fantastic response, 70 uh, contributors to that particular call. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at the first 35 of those uh, poster showcases. And the second uh, series of the 35, the remaining 35, will feature on the uh, scholarship hour this Friday. So have a look out for that. Um, also, all of these uh, posters and resources will feature in the National Forum Hub, which can be found on www.teachingandlearning forward slash vital. So have a look for that uh, after the week has complete and share with your colleagues. So let's, let's roll that video now on the posters, please.
fantastic. Okay, some really fantastic resources in there, folks. So please try and go back to that beautiful gallery. And congrats to the uh, National Forum staff for creating that. So the second batch of posters will be uh, released at the Friday Scholarship Hour. So uh, please do not miss that and, and take some time to go back into that lovely gallery and peruse those uh, posters with lots of transformational learning for everyone. So back to our uh, GASTA master now. Tom, over to you to introduce our, our next batch of uh, GASTA talks. Thank you very much, Corinne. And uh, yeah, I'd like to echo uh, some, some great work there and certainly encourage people to, to, to go in and, and have a look at all those uh, great resources. Uh, we're now moving back down to uh, MTU to another colleague there. Um, uh, this stage here, it's uh, Niall Fahey. Um, so uh, presenting presenting on his talk, Compliance is the Key. I see, I see Mary Fitzpatrick is here as well. So as I said, I expect her to be doing some counting and uh, Ken McCarthy here, the, the the younger version of me, he likes to think the younger, better looking version, but uh, I, I don't know whether that can be improved upon, but there you have it. As I said, it's just it's just the lighting, I think, makes all the difference for the moment. Anyway, right, so we started off going to the left, we're now going to the right. Garod, I see you there as well, and you're, you're there here to support Niall, so I, I expect to see... Uh, uh, you know, a big, a big level of gusto with the counting in to to, to give Noel uh, a, a fabulous count in. So we're all ready. Get the hands up. We're going to go to the right. Are we all ready? A bit more shouting, a bit more energy here. Ken, I'm watching you particularly. Are we ready? Here on, uh, you have to follow that up. You've done a great gust and now do a great count. Are we ready? A hane, a doe, no. a tree, a, tree. a, a cat, cat. a cat. a cat. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, so yeah, my name is Niall. Uh, I'm working in MTU in the Technology Enhanced Learning Department. I'm just going to be talking about scenario-based learning and if using that can improve students' knowledge retention in online learning. So I suppose brief background to the study that was uh, I was working with a pharmaceutical manufacturer on redesigning their GMP compliance training. So in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, compliance training is very important from an audit perspective. Uh, such training is typically tied to mandatory regulations and other legal requirements. It's also needed for companies in the sector to maintain a manufacturing license. Uh, the training over is often uh, viewed as, an, as a nuisance and as something that needs to be got through. Uh, the emphasis tends to be on the transmission of information and the learner ultimately passing an assessment uh, so an auditor can be shown the site is compliant. The company, however, wanted to ensure compliance training had an actual impact on learners and improve their critical thinking. So this was hoped that would allow them to react to situations in their day-to-day -day work and not impact production schedules rather than just being able to pass a one-off assessment. Uh, the focus, therefore, was to look at active learning theories, which promote the benefit of, uh, benefits of learners being actively involved in the learning process. Uh, so the relevant literature here and related studies underscore the need uh, to put learners into scenarios where they have the opportunity to apply the knowledge being learned in a meaningful and engaging way. The study explored the use of scenario-based e-learning to improve uh, good manufacturing practices, compliance training. So the study um, the participants is, uh, uh, were randomly divided into two groups, uh, one group completing an active scenario-based e-learning course and the other undertaking a more uh, typical passive e-learning course covering the same learning objectives. So participants completed a pre-test, a post-test upon completion of their respective course, and seven days later, then they were required to complete a retention test to evaluate, evaluate how much knowledge of the content they retained from the prospective course uh, they completed. So each participant, participant was then invited to take part in an unstructured interview to identify their experience of the course. Did they enjoy it? Were they engaged with the content? How they felt about their learning? And did they feel their retention of the information was improved, stayed the same, or was made worse by the approach they undertook? Uh, the content for the scenario-based uh, approach inserted the learner into real-life situations where they encounter, which they may encounter whilst carrying out their duties on site. Following the approach uh, outlined in the research, meetings were arranged with various subject matter experts across the organisation to create realistic uh, scenarios based in authentic uh, learning settings, as will be experienced by the learner in their daily uh, uh, work life, I suppose. At the beginning of each scenario, the module, uh, the learner is presented with a map of the site, which highlights the scenarios and areas of the site where they could occur. The learner then is actually in control and they choose which order they want to complete those scenarios. To ensure then the credibility, all the options presented to the learner to solve the scenario had to be viable as the consequences presented. The learner is provided with a real world consequence for the action they've chosen immediately, which indicates if they've gotten the scenario correct or incorrect. Once all the scenarios have been completed, the learner then is presented with a summary of their performance in the scenarios, giving feedback on correct and incorrect selections based on prior site incidents to further reinforce the learning. Uh, 
Um, so in terms of findings, I suppose, um, yes, compliance training is really boring. Um, I know obviously I jest about that, but it kind of is. Um, participants uh, completing the scenario-based approach, it is shown had a 64% improvement between pre and final test, with those in the passive group only showing an 18% improvement. For all tests carried out, those participants who completed the scenario-based approach had a greater improvement in their retention of knowledge when compared to the group who took part in the traditional passive uh, compliance training. In the unstructured interviews, then 80% of participants that took part in the scenario-based uh, approach felt the approach had actually a positive impact on their knowledge retention, um, whereas only 20% of the participants that took part in the traditional approach uh, felt that it had a positive impact on their knowledge retention. Uh, an unexpected finding in this was obviously it was learner preconception. Uh, most interviews had negative feelings uh, towards the topic before actually attempting anything. Um, so it, it, this probably could impact then and actually how much knowledge they re retain. So past experience had certainly tainted their perception of the training ever before they, the learning had, had begun. Um, so as an unexpected finding from the study, it does appear to be a natural outcome from the traditional passive approach often taken in corporate compliance training. And it's probably something that's true across the board. Preconception going into a course can also, can, can sometimes, been, uh, I suppose, impact. A benefit of the scenario approach is the creation of a hook or reference point that a learner can recall at a later stage when attempting to, re uh, to, to retain information in their interviews. Several participants acknowledged this stating they found themselves recalling some of the scenarios when attempting the final test. So building and forming these links is only possible by creating learning environments which the learner can apply what they're, what they're learning, making the connections and the knowledge being learned and real world situations. Participants of the scenario based approach had this link with each scenario being Tied to a location on a map of the site, which they could select a point which participants mentioned was beneficial, was this link from the map of the site to the realistic nature of the scenarios. So they were to hook back to that and think of that when they were trying to answer questions. In closing, it must be noted that the results are from a small sample size. There are limitations to what can be taken from them. However, these results suggest that knowledge retention is likely to be improved with a scenario-based approach and if the context of the scenarios are well designed and implemented effectively. Thank you. That was impressive. From the time I said 10 seconds, you completed it in three seconds. So that was seriously, seriously impressive, Noel. Uh, and you're right, I suppose, uh, yeah, uh, compliance mightn't sound the most interesting of stuff, but it certainly, it certainly needs to be done. And these are strategies which I think can be translated across a, a wide range of, of uh, teaching and learning uh, situations. So uh, so well done. Um, so uh, we're, we're now moving from MTU up to UCD, uh, Dr. Clara Dignan and uh, Presentation on student partnership in a well-being research, uh, sorry, in well-being research and uh, scholarship. Now, just looking there, Ken McCarthy's looking a little bit too, uh, you know, relaxed and sitting there. He's hiding down there. So I wasn't going to do it for the last uh, one, but I think you know, do you know what? Look, it we're we're at the midpoint of 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 the Gaston Marathon, and I think people are starting to flag. So we're going to be doing the up and down, not for the last one, but we're actually going to be doing it for this. And we're going to be led by Ken on this case here. I'm going to see him standing up here, Ken, right? So my, my sort of, sort of you know, uh, doppelganger there like that. So Kira's going to go, what the hell have I signed up for here? But I can tell you, Kira, if you haven't done a Gaston before, this is certainly your infra tree. But as I said, the only fun uh, that I really have is, is, is calling a stop. And everybody is impeccable in their time. But I better uh, sort of get moving on here. So we're going to go up on the hay, down on the dough, up on the tree, down on the car, up on the cooig, and a shout of gas. Are we all ready? And I'm watching particularly Ron and Bray, Kieran and O'Leary, uh, Alice and Ron and Bray, who I can all see here. So there's nowhere to hide. I don't care, you know, if the rest of you are not participating, but the rest of you are all there. Oh, Katrina McGrattan is there, so we're all going to be there. I want to get one of those masks as well. Okay, are we all ready? We're going to get the hands up for us, and then we're going to go. Ready? A hand. A doe. Come no. on, shout it. No. A tree. A tree. A car. A car. A cooey. Costa. Costa. No, I have not done a GASTA before, but it's definitely a great experience. So thanks very much. Uh, my name is Kira Degnan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in UCD and in the Insight SFI Research Centre for Data Analytics. And I'm representing an Insight team listed on the slide here who are working on a student wellbeing research and education initiative called Flourish. And Flourish is an acronym for Fitness for Life in our universities, realising informatics for students to thrive. So a bit of a mouthful there. Um, I'm going to briefly highlight today why student partnership was so central to the development and evaluation of both the research project and the module, how we did that, the outcomes and some of the challenges we encountered. And if you're wondering how I'm planning to do that in five minutes, well, I'm not really, but I am going to invite you to attend a vital event that we're hosting next week um, on embedding well-being um, in the curriculum. So 
Student well-being is a significant concern for us in higher education. Um, research tells us that only 42% of young adults in Ireland are within the normal range for depression and anxiety. Um, and college, finances and the future are the, stop, the top three stressors that they report. Students live in a digital world and we wondered whether we could help them to better harness their digital experiences and data to support their well-being through things like growing their self-awareness and enhancing their ability to self-manage. But we knew that for students to be able to do this, they needed to have underlying knowledge and skills about their health, development and well-being. So what I mean by that is, for example, being able to understand why sleep and exercise might be beneficial for their well-being, understanding how to reflect on their current behaviours, understanding how to set smart goals um, and how to be successful in trying to change th those behaviours so that they might better utilise digital tools in our current world, like mobile applications, for example, that could help them to initiate and monitor those changes. So we created a new module on exactly that with students and other stakeholders around the university as partners in the design. The module is called Sort Your Life Out and Thrive. Um, it's an elective and discipline agnostic module and the content features everything from physical and mental health to time management and goal setting to relationships and communication skills. Um, and it's all in the context of the digital world that we inhabit. To evaluate and iterate the module over time, we scaffolded several ways of understanding the student voice throughout. So we did entry and exit interviews to understand why students registered for the module and what their experience was. Uh, we did class polls so that we could meet the students where they were every day. Um, and so picture here is a one word check in for how the students were feeling using the poll everywhere software. We used a modified critical instinct questionnaire after personal development seminars. We ran World Cafe style discussions. Um, and finally, we used their assignments, which included personal development plans, group work, uh, which they were co-designing digital tools to support well-being. Um, and finally, their final reflections on their growth in the module. One without its challenges, like, for example, getting students recruited for entry interviews before the module started when registration in UCD, for example, stays open for the first four weeks of the semester. Um, getting research ethics to run studies where the students are also part of a graded module and also communicating about the research on top of all the emails and correspondence the students already get, um, especially when they were learning remotely. That was really challenging. But we did learn how to improve the module while ensuring it remains student centred and meets the students' needs. So, for example, in the last run, we found that time management and self-management skills were strong themes in terms of students' needs. Um, and so we've emphasised that more in our current offering of the module. The findings and the student needs also inform parallel research that we're doing on developing digital supports for student well-being moving forward. So we believe that the time has come for evidence-based approaches to embed well-being in the curriculum and we're not the only ones. So if you're interested to hear more about this and many other initiatives happening across the country, I'll invite you to join us next Tuesday morning for our online event on embedding well-being in the curriculum, where we'll have case study presentations, audience interaction, and we'll look to create a community of practice um, and a panel discussion on what the future of student well-being looks like in higher education. So you can scan the QR code here. I'll also pop the link in the chat if anyone is interested to hear more. And that is Gasta. Excellent. Well done, Kira. And if you're a first time out, well done. So a round of applause for, for Kira. Uh, never easy. So listen, I'm just mindful of the time here. So we're going to move from Dublin up to Letterkenny Institute of Technology, where we have Krina O'Donoghue uh, presenting the UNIQUE creative uh, process. I didn't want to call it unique I, I think it's actually spaced out you no it is unique <laughs> or oh, it is unique <laughs> yeah oh, you're safe spaces. enough yeah oh yes oh sorry about that or, i was only no, going no. to call it or else unique you okay <laughs> <laughs> moving along quickly here i mean get, get get the hands up here we just i won't even actually do up and down just straight out and then we're going to be lashing it out uh, after that okay so if everybody's ready we're going to start off hey hey do three three car, car. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Prona Donahue, and alongside my colleague, Dr. Tina Patton, we've developed a custom creative process for use in education and enterprise. We're obviously very fond of acronyms in this uh, group. Um, we're both lecturers in the Department of Design and Creative Media at Letterkenny Institute of Technology. And for the last four years, have shared delivery of a module entitled Communication and the Creative Process. 
and it's delivered to all first years across our undergraduate programs. And um, rather than a eureka moment that often people think is a creative creativity, um, as Picasso famously said, inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. And a creative process gives you form to this working. It breaks uh, the challenge down into manageable chunks, helps counteract the creative equivalent to a writer's block. And importantly for creative entrepreneurs, gives a model to help structure pricing. So many of you may have heard the term design thinking. Um, this is one of many processes that exist. And even those who think they don't follow a specific process naturally go through many common steps. When we began teaching the communication and creative process module, we looked at all the different models that were out there and we adopted the established D-School approach, originally developed, by, uh, developed at Stanford University. And it is empathize, define, ideate, prototype and test. And although this is really useful, we felt it lacked the very important stage of reflection. And having consulted with our students, it was felt that this language was quite alien to them. So as I say, having researched the other models, we developed our own acronym for our students and we called it UNIQUE. So that stands for understand, needs, ideas, quick prototype, use and evaluate. So I'm just gonna briefly bring you through this now. Central to successful design is an understanding of what you're being asked to do and who you're doing it for. This applies to the end user who's going to use your product or service or enjoy your movie or whatever it is that your creative, your creative endeavor, but there's also stakeholders involved. And the understand stage explores and examines this. In the second stage, need, this is where you really bore down to the kernel of the brief, the true challenge of the project, and you identify what really needs to be done. This mightn't be the, the, first, the, the, the brief you're actually given. Then it's on to what is for many of our students, their favorite stage ideas. Without the previous stages, however, this can be a hollow exercise. Authenticity is key and placing the end user at the center of all decisions is integral. Unusually, I will use the Eureka moment here because surprisingly it's often when people are at the quick prototype stage that they have that moment. This is the making stage, the materialization of an abstract thought before now. In making, the pitfalls and assumptions are often unearthed. In every brief, we stipulate the need to consider universal design and the environmental considerations of our students' solutions. These become really apparent at this stage. And in many ways, uh, having unique, the Q in unique, um, gave us a, a really great um, reason to emphasize the prototype. It's quick. It only needs to be at a level of detail that in the next stage, use someone, ideally your target audience, can interact with it and give you feedback. And this is a really invaluable stage of the process. And that's followed by the evaluate stage where you reflect on these comments and you adapt or you know, adapt your solution accordingly if you agree with the people. So not only do we utilize this process with LIT students and other departments have incorporated it also, but we've been really fortunate to receive um, HEA funding and we have delivered the DICE Academy, which sees 100 transition year students descend upon us each year from skills across County Donegal. And each year they're given a different brief and they come up with a product, service or experience to that theme. And the images here are from the very first iteration of that project, which was Linger Longer at Malin Head. And of course, as with everyone, we've had to adapt. Um, and this year we actually delivered the program online. We also work with um, community groups. So this is one of the projects that we do with Letter County Cathedral Quarter. And we've been really fortunate by this partnership, um, including that some of our students' ideas have been realized, um, which is really great when a live project and becomes, seconds. oh sorry um and i guess just you know we apply it in different ways as well with social enterprises as well so that's me i guess that'll do <laughs> thank you guys and apologies for almost running over well done uh well done uh so round of applause and it said not easy so as i said i'm mindful of our time so if people give um Karina, a, a virtual round of applause. We'll move uh, from Letterkenny back down to Dublin to Maria uh, Morgan from the Royal College of Surgeons. 
on rapid implementation of a hybrid converged teaching model with a large class impact on student performance and satisfaction ratings. So this time, I won't ask you to move up and down, but I will ask you to go, instead of going, hendo three hand kuig, we go kuig kara three do hain, and then shout gossip. So we're starting now, a little bit, let's, let's just mix it all up here. Get the hands up. So instead of the hands coming up with one finger, we're going up five fingers straight up from the start. Garo, that's it. Okay, are we all ready? We're going to start off. Kuig. Kuig. Kahar. Three. Do. Hain. Hain. Gosta. So thank you very much um, for the opportunity to share our recent experience of implementing a high flex teaching approach for our year one medicine program. Uh, so, as uh, was experienced by everyone in higher education, uh, last year brought uh, a lot of unprecedented challenges in terms of delivery of our uh, program. First semester one, we had all of our students who are mostly international students uh, based in Dublin, um, and we were able to rotate their attendance uh, on campus. However, um, for semester two, the start of semester two coincided with the uh, third COVID wave where we had a massive spike in, in COVID cases. Um, and many of our students had traveled home for Christmas um, and so were overseas. So a decision was made at the time to send, the message was sent really for students to stay in place wherever they were. It was thought to be the safest, so not to travel. So international students to stay where they were if they were in Dublin to stay there. And so that resulted in me going a little bit grey, but also uh, we had 50% of students exclusively online. So that was mostly our international cohort. And 50% of our students um, could still avail of on-campus blended approach uh, attendance. So they could avail of socially distanced face-to-face -face teaching, and we managed that by designating their time on campus through specific learning communities, which didn't mix. So we implemented uh, this high flex approach. So when this was first muted, there was a lot of interesting discussion and WhatsApp messages about it. But essentially what this involved was um, faculty simultaneously teaching online and in person. And this allowed us uh, to facilitate the students uh, to, to engage synchronously, either exclusively online or via an on-campus um, blended approach. Now, in reality, what this looked like for us uh, is you can see here, we were fortunate that we had a designated lecture theatre that only our class uh, could use. Um, it's very large, so this allowed us to uh, comfortably accommodate 80 students at a time with a two metre social distancing. And then the remainder of the class engaged um, synchronously online. So never ones to waste a good crisis. We thought we will look at this now um, and investigate what is the impact of uh, this converged teaching approach with our two cohorts, the exclusively online and the uh, blended approach. And we looked at academic performance and student satisfaction. So first of all, if we look at the outcomes academically, uh, first of all, we could say that we were able to deliver the curriculum successfully, and I don't have scope here to go into all the modifications we made to do that. But in terms of performance, um, we've seen a comparable com uh, overall performance with previous years, so no significant change. There was also no difference in overall exam performance between the two cohorts, those that um, attended completely online versus uh, those uh, that availed of the um, blended on-campus approach, as you can see here. Um, so all students had the same experience during semester one. And so I've just designated them into the two groupings. So you can see there was no difference in the academic cohorts as it were, but then in semester two, they had the differing experiences and there was no difference um, in terms of overall performance. However, where we did 
what, what was interesting was students' um, self-reported satisfaction levels with the, the modules at the end of the semester. So the students who availed of teaching exclusively online actually reported lower satisfaction levels compared to the blended uh, learning approach. And that's probably not surprising to us as educators, um, but nonetheless, it's um, important, I think, to be aware of. So in conclusion, we can say that the we successfully transitioned to this high flex and, and blended learning approach and it mitigated um, risk for our very large class size while allowing us to engage with these students, a lot of whom it was their first year of college, they were international students on their own and so on. So it was important. And I suppose high flex is a very attractive method to address student demand for flexibility, but I do think we need to consider the impact that um, it has on students' satisfaction levels. And I suppose really, you know, what we want is not always what's good for us. So I'll leave you with that thought. Gasta. Excellent. Well done. Well done. Another <laughs> absolutely bang on the money uh, presentation. So no, absolutely brilliant. Well done. Listen, can everybody just give a virtual round of applause to all our Gosta tiers today? We've got through a lot. We had eight uh, really good projects. Uh, check in the chat. A lot of people have put up links and really get back onto the website because I really think there's some superb work. I am mindful of the time, so I'm not going to hang about. I'm going to hand you back to Karina and I'll see everybody again tomorrow for tomorrow's lunchtime sessions. That's great. Thank you, Tom. And we are up against the time now, all right? Although this last piece is actually quite important to us. A critical success factor for all of us is to get that student perspective. And we're going to ask our one of our um, associates, uh, student uh, assembly people to come along uh, and give us a few insights and reflections. Now, I'm just mindful that we have Melissa Bergen in Limerick in the chat backing up uh, student reflections and thanks for that Melissa but on camera here we have uh, Eleanor Ronan from UCD and uh, Eleanor is going to provide us with some key insights on our presentations today over to you Eleanor. Hi so hopefully everyone can hear me um, I'm going to jump straight in since we're a bit short of time and um, starting with the talk by Jared Blit Cullinan um, I think it was really brilliant and the resource created is really interesting I had never considered, I suppose, as an art student, but just generally um, how important it is for students in medicine to learn from the past. But when it comes to learning from the different illnesses that are perhaps less common nowadays, and also learning from mistakes made in the past as well, and um, how medicine has improved since then. Um, especially when Dervla mentioned how close the surgeon can be to success and how those little details make such a difference. Um, and also, I think it, the fact that it allows for self-directed learning is fantastic because I think students will really enjoy that. And it allows them to learn anatomy online, which is particularly important in a COVID-19 situation when access can be a little bit more difficult. Um, so then Sandra Nicholson's um, presentation on animal emotions in veterinary nursing. I found this really interesting and I have a friend in veterinary nursing, so I'll certainly be asking her more about it. But uh, there were several uh, points that I thought were really good um, in terms of the interaction between students and the content. Um, the fact that I suppose in lectures, students often miss signals and then after the, going through this process of discussion boards that they slowly develop this. Um, and as well, I suppose the fact that um, veterinary students are also human <laughs> and that you know, they can get distracted in their learning when an animal is used in this practice and um, even use different language for certain animals other than um, that are, that's different to others. So it's really interesting and I think it's definitely a valuable resource in terms of um, helping them to develop these skills, I suppose, um, more generally. And then the active framework as well, I think is really important. Um, especially because I think it's the best way for students to learn is through active learning. And um, especially the poster seems to be a great resource. And I hope I'm, I'm certainly going to have a look at it later on. And I also found it quite brilliant that it was the poster itself is also a, a very good example of active learning. So it's active learning about active learning in a way. Um, and it's great that building trust is a really important part of it and that students um, voices are being taken into account and that through this I think it'll make sure that they really value
value the resource because they're given a chance to get to know it and they'll see why it's important that they use it. And um, so, yeah, and then the workshop on January 13th would be great as well in that. And Kieran O'Leary's talk as well was brilliant. Um, the Shore Bites especially looked really good and I could see it even being used in terms of um, second level students as well and getting them involved in sciences. I know this is a big push especially to get girls involved in science and getting them involved in real research that they can see around them is uh, probably the best way of doing this. And as well, I could see it working in other disciplines like the arts as well and just getting students engaged in more in things that are really relevant to the world around them. I think it's, it's a great idea. And how are we going to feed Martian colonies? <laughs> it's like it's a question that anyone I think would be interested in, regardless of how um, how much knowledge they have in the sciences. Um, and then Niall Fahey's talk in MTU. I think this is really important as well, and definitely the realistic scenarios I think would help learning for students because they'll if they experience experience those scenarios and um, in real life their training will come back to them so I know I've done um kind of training in this regard with um safety training and that means that if you come across those scenarios you remember oh I've seen this before and I know what to do so I think it's really important and it's great um, and it's kind of ties in as well to the talk about the active learning and that really shows that there's a, a movement now towards getting students more actively involved in learning and that developing those learning hooks that they can remember later on. And then um, Kira's talk on um, student well-being, I think is really important. I think the, um, the title of it is also fantastic because I myself am in UCD and the title of it caught my attention on campus, Sort Your Life, life Out and Try It, I think is something that students, it, it's not um, the usual name for a module and it really does catch people's attention. I was surprised to see that student well-being only 42% were in the normal range for depression and anxiety, so it really shows that this is kind of something that's very much needed. And I thought the class polls on how students were feeling are actually, is actually something that could work in other modules, maybe, because it would perhaps indicate when students are more likely to be able to engage the module and explain maybe why, when they're not doing so well, why their grades maybe aren't reflecting that, their, or their true ability. So the online event next Tuesday morning would be great as well for that. And then the unique ideas talk was fantastic, especially, I think, the idea of using creative process to show the value of creativity as well, that if you can see, oh, this artist has gone through this process um, to create this, um, it really shows the value of what they've created. They've put this much time in, they've gone through this process. And I think the DICE Academy looks great and it will really get um, transitioner students involved in creativity and hopefully as well open their minds up to maybe the possibility of going into creative um, careers in the future, which I think sometimes there, people are not afraid to go into. But when there's this process, clear process, I think it'll make it easier for, for them to see it as a possibility. And then quickly, I'll go on to uh, Maria Morgan's talk in RCSI. Um, I think it, it's a fantastic that, um, insight into the year we've had. I was actually quite surprised that students' um, performance didn't drop um, over. So it's a real, <laughs> it shows the hard work that RCS has put in and it really shows um, uh, that a lot of the high flex teaching model, that it, it, it was a great success, I suppose. But then also the difference in satisfaction is a real indicator, I suppose, that we're always better when we're in person and working together. And um, on that note, I suppose, it's been a great to hear different talks and it, to learn from each other. And I've really enjoyed the Goss talks today. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks for those uh, uh, reflections. Uh, great summary there, Eleanor. Thank you so much. And sincere apologies, folks, for the overrun today. It's all good stuff, though. Um, I suppose it only leaves me to remind you that we have two more scholarship hours to go for the rest of the week. Um, and we have Professor Chris Lynch tomorrow as the research fellow from UCC. Thank you so much to all our speakers um, and also poster contributions today. Um, thank you for sticking with us if you're still here. 
and um, maybe just a little thing to look out for today. Uh, I believe there's a little video of Tom Farley uh, going to be floated on social media later. So that should be good for everyone to have a, a little uh, look at there. Thanks, Tom, for all your hard work as Gastomaster. And look forward to everyone tuning in to the next two hours over the remaining vital week. Thank you so much.